a small lipless bait, especially on grass fisheries, is a fantastic lure to cover water and find them. You can bomb cast this thing. I generally like to go with a little bit smaller size if I'm not stroking it. So if I'm actually taking this thing and yo-yoing it back and forth, I would use a little bit heavier one. But this is where we're just completely just bomb casting it out and just reeling it back in. Um, if the water has grass in it, this is 100% my number one choice that I'm going to go with this first to try to cover water and find them. Find them, by the way. And I, you did a video on that between lipless and chatterbait for finding fish. And that's a really good video if you want. Square bill crankbait. I usually like to go with a hotter color. Um, water in, in the wintertime, and that wintertime is usually clear. But as you get closer to spring, and as you know, the wind is up there. There's more chop on the water. Uh, there's a lot of rain. That water gets cloudy. And going with a black and yellow color pattern on your baits, especially for your hard baits, dude, it cannot be beat. Um, this is a Spro Little John. If the water's a little bit dirtier, I'm pushed up a little bit shallower. I'm going to start throwing a spinnerbait. Key with the spinnerbait, you need a little bit of chop on the water, and you need to understand the depth in which you're using it. With, with these blades, the spinnerbait wants to lift off the bottom. It wants to come off the bottom. And a lot of times what gives this bait, what makes it so effective, is being able to bump bottom. And everyone, you know, you all know this. You have to maintain bottom contact. So when you're throwing your spinnerbait, what really tells me whether I'm going to throw the spinnerbait or not is depth. And again, yes, you can throw a spinnerbait in more than 10 feet of water. There's no problem there. But generally, broad breath strokes, you're going to fish that thing in shallower water. So once those fish start pushing up to water that's accessible to the spinnerbait, depending on the cover in the lake, I'm going to, I'm going to have one of those tied on. It was really interesting. I heard a really good conversation in the difference between the spinnerbait and the chatterbait. And honestly, they're very interchangeable. Um, it's just the flash and the vibration. That's the biggest thing. This one doesn't, a chatterbait does not have the same flash as a spinnerbait does. The chatterbait has a different vibration profile than a spinnerbait. So the next bait that's on my list, the 3.3 to four inch Kitek. This is a key tip and trick here. These thread in blades with a screw lock. So what I can easily do is I can take that bait like that and I can just screw that thing into the, to the head of the bait. And then all of a sudden, I have flash attached to it. It makes this one bait a Swiss Army knife. I can make one bait into two different styles. I can throw this without the blade, screw a blade on real quick, keep fishing it, and see if there's a difference. And from there, I can change my plan of attack. If all of a sudden I start getting smoked on a swim bait with flash, hey, maybe I need to start throwing a spitter bait. Maybe I need to start throwing something more with flash. Is a jerk bait. Uh, this one's right off my BFS setup. I like the smaller ones. Now, now hear me out. I know I'm going to get killed in the comment section. Tom, why not the fluke? Why not the fluke? Tom, why not the fluke? We all love the fluke. I love the fluke. Hookup percentage. Hookup percentage. If I use a fluke, and I, because I pond fish too, guys, I remember that. When you jerk that rod on a fluke, those fish will sometimes mouth it. And when you go back to jerk and you didn't realize you had one, you pull that thing right out of their mouth. Unless you know that they're there, whether it's line detection, you feel them, what have you, you're going to miss a lot of fish on that fluke. I like to fish the fluke, but first, I'm going to try with this. If I can get away with throwing something with treble hooks, and this is my personal opinion, okay, you can do what you want to do, but you have a higher chance of hooking a fish with treble hooks than you do with a single hook. Granted, I'm not talking about landing percentage. I'm just saying hooking. If I'm searching, I need to have a bite. I need to see a fish. So. I usually like to go with treble hooks first on my search lures because at least if I snag one, I can get a vibe to like, okay, that's where he was setting up. That's what he was doing. He's a little white. I get clues and then I can make adjustments to a single hook. So throw smaller jerk baits. And I'm, this is the key trick. Go with braid to a heavy leader. So if you're using a monofilament leader of above 10 pound test, it'll actually get the jerk bait to rise up in the water column. So you can fish it a little bit shallower uh, or just an old school Rapala, something that that's a little bit smaller, you know, Yamamoto, uh, you know, green pumpkin, watermelon, like those two colors are absolutely the best. So the key with this, if you're going to rig it wacky style, Gamagatsu, weedless, but you're going to hook it right in the egg sack or what it's also called as the collar, the collar area of the bait. Now here's the key. So you take a, a tool like this uh, or VMC makes pliers too. You put a little piece of rubber on it. And then you thread the piece of rubber onto the bait. And what that does is it helps latch it in there so the worm lasts longer. 
again, if you're on a budget and you have to pick between getting Yamamoto's, which are a little bit more expensive, and buying a threading tool, just get the new Yamamoto's and save up for it. But you do not actually need it to make this bait work. This is my number one that I really like to do this time of year. It's a plain old shaky head. I like to throw this like I would throw a jig. Because like I said earlier, the water clarity is usually a little bit, the visibility is lacking, let's just say, in a lot of our fisheries. If you were fishing Lake Hartwell, Lake Murray, where you still have, you know, a thousand feet of visibility, I would throw this on spinning tackle. But if you're fishing the tidal Potomac, let's say, or, you know, Smith Mountain Lake with some chop, I would throw this on a three eighth ounce head. I'm going to throw it on a medium heavy bait caster with 12 pound fluorocarbon. And then what I can do is I can pitch and flip this thing just like I would do a regular jig. Now that's just kind of my setup because I can get away again with a little bit beefier hook and I can jack them a little bit harder. Don't always actually use the Yamamoto avenues. And that is with trick worms. And the reason being is a lot of the ponds and stuff in Northern Virginia and Maryland are stupid pressured. Yamamoto stick bait is fantastic for most places, except when you're dealing with super, super pressured fish, because again, that's what they see. Everyone's throwing that stick worm. Going down to a four inch or a seven inch trick worm, it's just going to get you bit way, way more. And again, if you guys remember uh, last week's live stream, where we talked about BFS gear, bank fishing. I was throwing that on four pound, no, five pound sunline fluorocarbon leader when I caught that big one at Lake Frederick is about two years ago. And I had to keep going down in line size until I could get bit. And so when you're doing that, all I'm doing here is I'm downsizing my wacky rig. I'm downsizing my shaky head. So again, if, if, if the fish are highly pressured, if the pond are highly pressured, just drop everything down. 